Welcome to tonight's installment of the SciArc Cinema Series. Uh, this is a new series of screenings of films relating to architecture, although not necessarily. Also technology, visual culture, uh, tonight's film definitely the history of Los Angeles. Um, all these screenings are free and open to the public and it's the first Tuesday of each month during the school year. Uh, so my name is Michael Stock, I'm the host of the series. Uh, I'm also a professor here at SciArc teaching courses predominantly on film, although also some courses on music and comic books and uh, pop culture along the way. So um, tonight's film is one of my favorite films about Los Angeles. It's also a favorite noir of mine, even though it's a neo-noir and I want yeah, to get yeah, into that <laughs> in a little bit. Um, LA Confidential, released in 1997, directed by the late Curtis Hansen. Uh, and my guest is, tonight is the film's production designer, Janine Oppowal, who has received, uh, who received an Oscar nomination in the film, uh, for the film, which was the first of four? Four. So far? <laughs> yes, uh, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Still time. Lots of time. Uh, so Janine, start. I'm going to read to you from her bio, which she sent me. Uh, Janine started her career working with Charles and Ray Eames, uh, among the most famous American designers and filmmakers in recent history. Uh, the first film that she designed was Tender Mercies in 1983. Uh, she has received Academy Award nominations for LA Confidential, Pleasantville, Seabiscuit, and The Good Shepherd. Uh, other films for which she is known is Catch Me If You Can, The Bridges of Madison County, The Music Box, uh, her most recent films have been Rules Don't Apply uh, for, Willem, uh, for Warren Beatty, Wakefield with Brian Cranston, and the forthcoming The Best of Enemies with Sam Rockwell and uh, Taraji P. Henson. Uh, she served on the Board of Governors uh, at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences for nine years and on the Foreign Language Film Executive Committee as well. Just last week, she received a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, from the Art Directors Guild for her 40 years of outstanding work. So congratulations on that. It was very stressful. <laughs> I saw what we call the three vanities, hair, makeup, and wardrobe. Frightening. Uh, so, so since uh, Janine's career began, uh, you have worked on almost 50 films? I don't know. I stopped counting. Okay. I, I didn't I get count. the exact count <laughs> either. Uh, but she has moved from set director to art director to production designer. Uh, she oversees the finding of locations and the design and construction of sets and interiors from curtains and carpets to chairs and lamps. Uh, a production designer, she has been known to say is responsible for everything an actor walks in front of, sits on, drives through, or picks up. Um, and so I thought tonight, before we actually start talking about this film, uh, since we're sitting here in a room populated by architects and architects in training, uh, I was wondering if you would tell us a bit about your first job uh, working for Charles and Ray Eames and how that provided training for your work in the film industry. Well. I walked in the door of the Eames office as a guest, and on the way out the door, I asked his assistant, you don't have any jobs here, do you? And she literally looked me up and down several times, and then she said, well, as a matter of fact, we do. And I said, oh, well, what would that entail? And she listed things that I figured I knew how to do. And then she, the last thing she listed was handle post-production of the films. And I went, mm, I don't know anything about post-production of films. So I talked to Charles, and he basically said to me, well, you do not have a traditional design education, but I can teach anyone how to draw. What I cannot teach is how to think or how to see. If you know how to think and you know how to see, you can stay here and work. And of course, I, I didn't really, I was a kid, I didn't really understand what he meant. And it took me a while to figure, to figure it out. So I honestly think I learned design at the feet of the master. And it's the best way, I still think, to learn. I mean, I tell everybody that, you know, if you want to be a film designer, 
the best thing to do is to follow me around for a few months, and then you'll know you don't want to do the job. <laughs> uh, and and so, uh, like, what would have your your responsibilities would have been on those films? And can you talk a little bit about the what the what the films were? Somewhere. What the Ames films? The Ames films, yeah. Um, Which I know they're they're on DVD now. And, uh, yeah, he made over a hundred uh, or about a hundred. They were personal. Some were documentary. Most of them were industrial for clients. Mm -hmm. And I worked with them on the uh, Bicentennial, the films for the Bicentennial Administration about Jefferson and Franklin. And then we made little films about some of the exhibitions that we did for IBM about the history of astronomy. And uh, one of my jobs really was to figure out what the imagery needed to be and how to get that imagery, and who to talk to, and how to build it, or how to make it, or where did we have to fly to photograph it. Um, so it was, and then also I was writing a lot of the early versions of the text, um, because I'd had a certain amount of training as a writer as well. And so I just, as Charles would say, well, you do what you have to do to get the job done. So that's pretty much what I did. <laughs> Oh, this is the job? Okay, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do that. Right, wow. I mean, the process of pre-visualization is, I mean, that's what your entire kind of career has yeah, is that's, built on. That's, it's Very really kind of understanding a subject inside and out, and then figuring out how you process it out to the other end so that other people can understand it and relate to it and participate in it. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so to jump ahead to, to this film, to 1997 or I guess 96, when the film was coming together, how, at what point were you approached? Was it who, who was it that that came to you? How did um, that all start? Well, Curtis, I think I had met Curtis Hansen previous to that on another film, which I couldn't do. The schedule didn't work, and he called back for LA Confidential, and I read the script, and I met with him. And it was a very eerie feeling, because I definitely had the feeling that he knew and was also convinced that this film was going to be his masterpiece. And I can't tell you what tells you that. It's this, a, a sense. Um, of listening to the person talk and detecting the passion that's there. Um, so basically, he called me and asked me if I would do it. And uh, we discovered that we were both members of the LA Conservancy. And Curtis, as a director, had an unusual, unusually good knowledge of architecture in Los Angeles, unusual for a director. I mean, when I would mention a place to him or a kind of building, he would understand what I was talking about, as opposed to my having to explain it or go out and get photographs of it exactly. Mm -hmm. So he was, for me, he was very easy to work with because of that. Uh, I was thinking when preparing for this, I was in, in preparing to watch this film again, which I haven't seen for a couple of years. I was thinking about how your job in many ways is like being a detective, where you start with the script as sort of evidence and then reconstruct the world um, of, these, of these cases. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your process then on this film, how you went about building building the world. And, for this and, film. For this film. Yeah. And, and reconstructing the timeline of, of um, Los Angeles in the 50s. Well, I spent about 10 weeks in the car riding around looking for things. <laughs> and there were about 100, close to 100 locations or sets required when I broke down the script. And we ended up shooting them in about 50 different places. I was able to put some of them together. But really, it's, everybody's process is different, but I would make one piece of paper per set or location, and I would 
describe from the novel what was written. I would copy out of the novel what the novelist had said about the location, whatever the script had to say, any thoughts I had about it on my own. And I rode around in the car with those things with me. And in fact, there were five or six post-its on my car dashboard listing the set and what the action was that took place in that set. So that when I was driving down the street, if I saw something that looked correct or looked possible, I would quickly look at the post-it and see if it, if it satisfied the requirements. Um, and there were locations that were found in very bizarre ways. I mean, uh, the big film, the, the LA, the film premiere that you see in this, in this film, I found one night, I'd gone downtown to the music center with a friend of mine and we got off the Hollywood freeway to go to dinner in a place that I wasn't used to getting off and we were driving down the street and on my left side, I f saw, a, I just almost like felt this tower. And I knew from a lot of research that there was a theater chain in Los Angeles, now defunct, called the Tower Theaters. So I'm driving by and I just went, and I yelled at my friend who was with me in the car, stop the car, stop the car. And I opened up the car door and ran down the street and stood there and looked at it and looked up the street and went running up the street and identified a couple of houses that we could use and came back and called Curtis and said, I think I found the, found the movie theater. Because people all say to me, where did you find that movie theater? It wasn't a movie theater. I made it a movie theater. I wasn't finding a movie theater that satisfied any of the script requirements. They just, they didn't exist. So you have to make it up. And we had three days to put all that neon on, in, on that in front of that building. So we built the neon and the marquee separate and just carried it, put it in front of the building. And it has, it's a triangle and the front has to have a support because we couldn't attach to the building. Um, for a whole lot of reasons, like the owner didn't trust us. Uh -huh. And so I just had a black pole at the leading edge of it, and I said to Curtis, you see that black pole? He says, yeah, that's not supposed to be there. I said, it has to be there. You have to put extras standing there talking. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, one way, that, you know, you just have to know what the tricks are that you can pull. We had a day to put it there, a day to shoot it, and a day to get rid of it. So it's very hair raising. <laughs> I mean, with the neon truck, the neon guy standing by, because of course something always breaks. So I don't care what that costs. That guy's got to be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and how has the the process changed now? Like, how how much driving around do you do now um, when, when putting things? Together? Well, it, it very highly varied. Um, still drive around and look for stuff because a lot of, most stuff is still found real and then altered uh, to suit the story. Um, different films will have different amounts of real physical reality in them. And it's still expensive to shoot on a stage, on a sound stage. It's still expensive to erase stuff digitally. So yeah, I mean, most films are still made by finding the basics. So this one happened to have an awful lot to find. <laughs> Not as much as another one that I did, but that's a subject next year, you can call okay. me again. Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, you'll see, the number of locations is... It's a lot. It's mind-blowing, yeah. It's a lot. So, I mean, reviewing... And it was half as many as another film that I did later, so. Oh, right, <laughs> I think I know which one you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Um, so, I know that Curtis Hansen was a big, was a, cine, was a big cinephile. Yes. Um, and especially when it came to film noir. Um, and actually, I, I recall, personal, personal story, actually, when I first moved to Los Angeles, tail end of the 1990s, is when the American Cinematheque was doing the Sam Fuller 
retrospective. Right. And I was so broke, I couldn't, I could barely pay rent in that period, but I bought a ticket for every Fuller screening they did. And Curtis Hansen was there. Yeah. And he introduced a lot of the films and he would talk at that point about this project he's working on called LA Confidential. Yeah. And uh, so that's how the film sort of popped up on my radar. Oh, I see. Um, okay. You know, and to all the, yeah. the noir purists yeah. in the room. Well, he had, he had, he had a favorite few noir films that he screened so we could see them. And then we would talk about them a yeah. little bit. Um, Kiss Me Deadly was one of them. I can't remember, I would say five or six that he screened that, you know, so we could see them if we wanted to. But uh, uh, the best thing that I heard that was ever said about the film was a friend of mine took his dad, who was 80 some years old, to see the film. And he said to his, he said to his dad, so, how did you like that film? It was really good, period, wasn't it? And his dad looked at him and said, it was? <laughs> so, okay, Aww. that's great, thank you. <laughs> uh, well that, yeah, which leads me to my next question, which is when you're doing a, a neo-noir, how, as a designer, how bound or connected do you have to be to the original noir? Or how determined do you have to be to subvert all that has come before. I mean, how, um, how do you look at that? Well, we decided to shoot the film as if it were today and to just deal with the locations and the clothing by and large as if they were set in the past. So it was mm. essentially making a strange hybrid and one of the things that we decided not to do is to put the fedoras on the men. Men were all bareheaded in this mm, movie. They, right. So we dropped a number of the conventions, um, but kept enough of them, so it's a hybrid. Yeah. And that's, that's what I think makes it intriguing. Yeah. You, you look at it and you know, yeah, this is set in the past, but uh, well, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you try to play with the edges. Yeah, and I think watching the film now, 2019, it really registers on this dual level of like 50s noir, but also 90s. There's a certain, yeah. you can see like some of the textures and kind of right. trends in, right. in colors and, colors. and so yep. on of the 90s, mm -hmm. which I think is really interesting. Yeah, well, we're all, you know, prisoners of our own time zones. <laughs> right. Um, so one of the th central themes of this film, which seems to be a pervasive theme in Los Angeles, is the notion of illusion versus reality. I mean, the film is sort of confronting it, questioning it. Um, how does that layering, how do you go about dealing with that layering as a designer, where you're simultaneously trying to be true and realistic, but comment on illusion? That's really difficult. I mean, that's something that you kind of internalize from the story and then um, play with. I mean, the, there's no real way to sort that out. You can't, you can't really say, well, if I did this, then I would have to do that. It's more of an, it's just more rolling with your instincts. And Curtis always used to say it's about, you know, how things are never what they seem to be. Things are never, never, never what they're sold as. There's always something else going on. So, I mean, I could talk about this and tell you yeah, yeah, how, that, how it worked with, be great. This, with this location. Okay. Um, because if you were to have read the original script or have read the original novel, the description of the Victory Motel was that it was a small motel abandoned because the freeway had bypassed this on an old main route. But and the producer said to me, well, we don't have money and we are not going to build that motel. And I kept saying, oh, I don't think I can find it. 
So I knew once he said that, I had to prove that it could not be found. So I spent two days driving from San Bernardino to Ventura on old Route 66, and I found two motels that could work. One was unphotographable, and one was too far out of the zone of shooting. So I came back, and I showed the motels, and he said, all right, you win. And then I realized, now I have to find a place to build this thing. And I couldn't, I didn't have an idea. But I went home that night and I thought, I reviewed in my head my first impressions of Los Angeles. And the first impression I had was driving from the airport to Hollywood through the Stalker oil fields. And I remember thinking, what kind of a crazy ass place is this? There's a city, but there's oil wells in the middle of the city. So I went back that night and I thought about my earliest impressions of LA and then I thought, oh, the oil fields. What a great metaphor that would be for the story. Because what you have is you have these oil derricks and they're moving up and down all the time to their own rhythm in the background of the filming and they're sucking the earth dry. And it's a perfect metaphor for what's going on in the film, in this scene especially, because it's about police corruption sucking a certain kind of life out of the city. So that, that's how you think about it. You think about the sets as some kind of metaphor, in a way, a visual metaphor for what you're reading and thinking about in the story. And this one happened to work out really well in that way. It's a find, find a layering, find a depth, find a visual metaphor that will bring people into it, even if they don't go home saying, oh yes, well the oil derricks meant this and the set was that. It's still there. And it's a dead end. Because this was described as a place that in the scene, people couldn't get out. They were trapped there. So I found a place that was flat on a hill, and you couldn't get out there. Mm. If you tried, you'd be down in the valley, you know, falling so far down in the ravine, and the other side had dense trees and a road. So there was, it was a no exit kind of place. And I designed it as an L shape to sort of accentuate that no exit feeling mm. to the place. And then of course, it's all up to me what kind of motel that I want. Nobody had any opinions about it. Certainly the writer didn't, and Curtis didn't really have an opinion. So I sat and I thought, well, let's say if it's really abandoned by the 1950s, it would have been built in the 20s. So I went back and thought about 20s motels. And you see they had these little, this little garage that you can see straight ahead there. Uh, people used to have motels with places to park their cars inside. Cars were really precious then, you know, and you would park them inside. And we didn't use any of those I mean, on film, they're not used, but it's where the grips and electricians put all their equipment every night, it was <laughs> hidden very well away. So it was a very practical way to think about how to, how to do the set. And um, it really is a kind of a 20s motel. And it, we built in the sway backs on the, uh, on the ridge lines, you'll see. And then we, I put eucalyptus leaf stain on the roofs and bought all these bushes that were half dead. We sent somebody, the Greensmen went off to the, off to the uh, nursery and said, I want all your half dead bushes. <laughs> and then we planted those. And the Victory Motel is, you know, in the 50s, in the 40s after World War II, a lot of stuff was named the Victory this or the Victory that, and with a big V. So this is just the Victory Motel. And so, but that's kind of an answer to your way of how do you, 
how do you layer it? Mm -hmm. What are you looking for when you're looking for something? You know, it's, it's part of its intuition, its instinct, and you you see it, you know it. Anyway, right. And I mean, I, I would guess Curtis probably loved the layers of reflection to classic film noir like Touch of Evil with the oil derricks. Right. And right. makes me think of Bonnie and Clyde too with right. a very similar no exit it's situation. A similar, similar sensibility to the story. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um, uh, in a 2003 interview you did with the New York Times, you said, what I do for a living is not dissimilar from what an actor does. I have a different set of tools, but it's the same process. The reason that it's fun to design sets is that it allows you to try on personalities that you'd never otherwise experience. Uh, so I was wondering what, what personalities you got to try on in the <laughs> making of this film. Well, I think what I got to do is explore my relationship to Los Angeles as a newcomer, as an Auslander, as a non-Californian, as someone who still speaks with a New England accent. I got to explore the place that I lived and worked and to find what I had to say about who it was through the story. Because I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I have obviously had opinions about it and I would find my opinions when I would find the place. You know, it's, 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 it's just, again, it's just the kind of a process and I respond to one kind of building and another designer might respond to a different kind of building. So you can give the same script to a different group of people and you will get very, very different results. So it's the director's job to really work hard to find a designer whose opinions and feelings and emotional response to the material is close to their own. Because, I mean, believe me, I've worked with some directors who I, I should have walked out the door when they first called. Just like you have nothing in common. And you have to have that resonance mm -hmm. somehow because it's a team effort. Uh, so you were telling me before we started this, this of course done entirely by hand, yes. this drawing. Yes, that's a, I, I used to like making watercolors, so I, I still do. <laughs> and this was just to, you know, describe uh, what it was that I thought we were going to end up doing at this place and approximately what color it was going to be and any other little details. Um, that I was interested in. And I, I can show you that we used to draft by hand. See, all this is drawing the entire motel and it's all, you know, drawing by hand, elevations. And then uh, it's all built, that's proof. I'm finishing it and throwing the leaves and there you see the oil things straight ahead, scattering all the eucalyptus bits and, you know, the dying bushes. It looks, and then there's a scene inside where it has to look like it's half demolished. And we finished it all with real lath and plaster, the old way it would have been done. And then I stood in the room with the carpenters, and I said, okay, get started. More, 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 stop, enough. <laughs> and that's how we arrived at <laughs> making it feel like it had been begun to be demolished, because you, it's, I found it impossible to understand how to do it without doing it this way, doing the whole thing and then make an attack on it. To design it like this, it's always gonna come out looking like you know, bad theater in Schenectady, New York. <laughs> it's not going to work. And that's kind of what the inside looked like with some of it left, some of the lath and plaster left. And that's it, really. So that's all the slides that I brought. I could go on for an hour. <laughs> um, so at what point, are you still, do you still do watercolor? Do you do stuff by hand? Uh, and Yeah, I mean, sometimes, I, I always, if I'm thinking, 
about a ground plan. I will always do it by hand first. Just because I have a, you know, I, I'm the kind of person that I feel like I don't really understand something until I have moved my hands around it or in it or over it or written it out somehow. I, that's just how I'm, that's, that's something about who my parents were. I can't say anything else. Um, so I always do that. I sit and I do little ground plans by hand, and I try out as many variations as I can, think it through until I finally arrive at one that pleases me and answers all the story requirements about who comes in what door and does what to whom. And that's, then after I'm done with that, I throw it at someone else who takes it from there and works it out on the computer and I go out and scout more locations and I come back at the end of the day and then we sit at the computer and we redo whatever that thing was that I threw at, <laughs> at my art director. Right. So to, to kind of situate everyone in the room in time with the development of technology, what digital tools would have been used in this film in 1997? There are a number of scenes where things were erased digitally, and it was the very beginning of when we could do that. And there were certain locations that I said to Curtis, either you have 30 degrees to shoot, or we have to get somebody to help us erase the stuff that's wrong in the background because I can't afford to do it. There's not enough money, not enough time to do it. And so we found somebody who said, yes, okay, show me what you want and we will erase it in post-production. So I basically took large photographs and wrote all over the photographs what had to be altered and what had to be erased and what had to be changed. And it's principally the stuff around City Hall. So, but I don't know that you can tell because when it's well done, you don't know whether it was done or not. Right, right. You know, and that's the magic. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, a, a bit of magic uh, of the production designer, which is the, what you make unseen, you know, yes. or what you, yes. what you erase yes. from what is present to... Knowing yeah. what to take out is almost more important than knowing what to put in. I always grab the pencil and I said, pencils usually have two ends, the lead end and the eraser end. When you're doing a period movie, you use more of the eraser than you do of the lead. <laughs> <laughs> That's real true. Yeah. Well, so, and the films that you are, are best known for are predominantly period pieces. Um, I was wondering if this is a reflection of your, your own tastes, or if it's uh, sort of being pigeonholed as a period piece well, production a, designer? Or? It's a function of both things. You know, producers don't want to hire somebody to do a big period thing unless you've done something of that before, by and large, on account of the fact that they have to protect their investments. They want to know that the people that they're paying know what to do and how to do it. That's part of it. And so you, you do get typecast in the same way that an actor does mm -hmm. because you demonstrate competence in certain areas. But in addition to that, I, I, I tend to be a glutton for punishment. If there's more work and it's harder, I'll probably say, sure. You know? <laughs> That's, it's, it's part of who I am. And I'm also interested in history and being forced, as I was on this film and on other ones that I've worked on, being forced to learn something is really good. I mean, if you, I, I, I would hate to have a job where I had to get up in the morning and do the same damn thing every day. I would, I would lose my mind. I, just, I can't function like that. I have to get up every morning and have an unknown in front of me and to be able to trust the future that day's going to go fine. Even if it doesn't, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think that 
because of, uh, I guess, the way of the world and gentrification and rebuilding and so on, are there, is there a certain, will certain period pieces become extinct? Yes. The short answer of that is yes. We did hmm. LA Confidential and managed to find pretty much everything we needed without a whole lot of difficulty, aside from the fact that it took a long time. A few years later, I did Catch Me If You Can, which is another big period picture set, similar era, a little bit later. And it had already become infinitely harder to find stuff because of gentrification, because apartment buildings that we had used that had been empty, uh, had been rehabbed into condos, that kind of thing. And eventually, there are things that you cannot, you just can't shoot anymore. I mean, I remember the outcry that filmmakers had when all that green paint for the green bike lanes went on certain streets in downtown Los Angeles, and all the filmmakers were, oh my god, we can't shoot here anymore. <laughs> it's not possible. Because the lines on the street are totally different today than they were then. Mm. And OK, you can say, oh, well, you can just deal with it digitally. But the answer is, how much is it going to cost you to deal with it digitally? And usually, the answer is, too much money. So then you're forced onto some other street. And it's, it's the same problem. It just keeps, it, it keeps your, the pool of things to choose from shrinks. You know, not to mention the fact that nobody wants to go see anything set in the past anymore. They're too busy being worried about what the future is going to be. I mean, I don't understand anything about the past. God only knows how would I begin to think about the future. But that's me. You know, that's not everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm, I like to touch things and kick them. You see Maya Lin in that movie, uh, a documentary about Maya Lin, when she's working on one of her water installations, one of her water features, she's touching it. Her hands are going all over it all the time. And I thought, what if I do that? And then I saw Frank Gehry in another movie, a documentary Frank Gehry, and he's talking about it being the last time he's going to visit this building that he designed, and you see him walking down the hallway, and he's running his hands along the wood. And I think, yep, designer. <laughs> it's in you somehow. You have to touch it. It's part of yeah. what it's about. Uh, let me just ask maybe one more question here, then we'll, then we'll start the screening. Um, was there anything you did or discovered while working on LA Confidential that changed your style after that as a production designer? Any innovations um, or? No, I can't think of anything specific, but the whole process of designing a film is you're constantly looking for shortcuts. You're constantly looking for ways to do things more efficiently and faster. And so you build up a little repertoire of Oh, that's how you hide the air conditioner. Or, oh, that billboard's used to hide that. I need a billboard the next time. Or, you know, I don't need to replace the light head on that telephone pole. I just need to call the guy who's going to come and remove the light head. And so you, you start to develop those little shortcuts. And it, it, it saves producers money in the end, because you know how to do it the fastest way which is definitely the cheapest way. <laughs> okay. Um, OK, one last question. How, how does a production designer's personal style change over time? Or I guess, how, does, how, do, how, is, how do you feel your style has changed over time? Well, that's really difficult, because I only know myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, Part of it is there are things about the style that's always going to be the same because it's you. And you're interested in, like any artist, you're interested in, in working out certain ideas and certain things. Um, 
But the, pro the process is always the same, and what you learn from each project is different every time. And you become interested as you do the projects and different kinds of things and trying to express them in different kinds of ways. And I think a lot of it also has to do with willingness to put up with bullshit. The older I get, the less I'm interested in putting up with it and the more willing I am to just say, no. And it's a personal style, but it also has to do with how difficult it is to just get the job done. And I can't say that I think that my style has changed so much, but other people can probably recognize could recognize that in a way that I couldn't. I know that there were a couple of art gallery dealers who knew me in Los Angeles who would call me and say, did you design this film or this film? I missed the credits, but it looks like something you would do. And then I, they said, oh yeah, well we recognize your work. And I would look at them like, huh? <laughs> but I wouldn't know how to describe what makes it mine. It's just, it's something that comes out of who you are. But other people could recognize it. But don't ask me to describe it, I couldn't begin to say. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you.